Okay, this is a lame video. I'm warning you. <laughs> um, and it's also a video that will, if you care about this video and these issues and the slander that's been said about me, lies about me, then it will present you with a temptation to sin, just like it's presenting me with a temptation to sin in my heart um, in against the guys that are lying about me or, or just in my bitterness and bad attitude and the anger that naturally rises up when I see these things being spread. So let me explain what's going on and why I'm bothering to make a video about this. I'm going to go through several lies that have been told about me. I'll show you guys the clips. I'll show you the teachings I actually have. But I want to explain like why I'm doing this. Um, so why not just overlook it? Like, Mike, why not just overlook it and like be the bigger man and not respond to it? And I actually think that that's normally the way I handle people who say stuff about me online. <laughs> that's normally how I do it. And it happens every single day to me, right? So I do normally do that because you hardly ever hear me talk about it. But in this case, there's a guy called Doctrinal Watchdog. That's Doctrinal Watchdog Active that does um, like discernment ministry stuff online on YouTube. He has a very small channel. Nobody's heard of it, but he put up recently some videos that were deceptive about me, misleading about me. I tried to correct him and he didn't listen. Um, then Bible Thumping Wingnut, that's the name of their YouTube channel, BTWN News, which is Tim Hurd, a guy I know personally, just a little bit, not a lot. Um, he took those clips of me taken out of context and the misleading and deceptive content and then made another video, which has been getting a lot more views. This is uh, lies about my teaching. It's not just about me. Mike's, Mike's four foot tall and he only eats broccoli. Like that, it's not lies about me. It's lies about my actual teachings and the doctrine I teach and the things I believe. And a lot of people have been emailing my ministry right through BibleThinker.org, my, my website, have been emailing us and in the comments asking questions, you really believe that, Mike? You're supporting Bethel? Mike, you believe in Chris Vallotton? I always pronounce his name wrong. The prophet of Bethel? Um, oh, you, you've been slain in the spirit, Mike? I didn't know that. You believe, you support those things? This is the lies that are being told about me, and people are confused. Now, this means that people who follow my ministry and my teaching are going, either A, I now reject all of Mike's teaching, or I question you know, what the validity of whatever he says, which you should always question, just question for good reasons, not lies. Um, or B, they're more open to follow Bethel. They're more open to follow Chris Volatin and his fake prophecy and stuff like that because they think that I'm now supporting those things, right? So I, it, it's just, there's nothing good that comes of it. But I know that in first Corinthians, when Paul's ministry to the Corinthians was threatened by personal attacks against Paul, he didn't defend himself for the sake of himself. He did, however, defend himself, speak truth about himself and offer actual in scripture defenses of himself just as a way of keeping the bridge of ministry open to the Corinthians because they would lose out on the opportunity to be ministered to by him. And they would be controlled and misled by other people who were trying to bring people after themselves. So here we go. Uh, let's just get started with it. This is the first clip. This first clip has three lies about me, um, so you can hear them. And yeah. For it's the uh, prophet at Bethel Church. Shocking. I'm shocked. Um, I thought Mike was pretty solid. I thought that he was just not a Calvinist. And I do not think that he's solid anymore after uh, what okay. I watched and learned today and researched and what I'm presenting to you today. Okay, so one of the issues, <laughs> I'm rushing through this live stream. I will not spend 100 hours preparing this thing. So this clip did not start at the beginning. I'm just have to restart it. Hey folks, thanks for tuning in. My name's Tim, the BTWN guy, and you're watching BTWN News here on YouTube. Hey, like, share, subscribe, do all that. Mike Winger and Ruslan's shocking comments concerning John MacArthur and Bethel Church. Shocking to me. You, if you're asking, hey, who are these people? I'm gonna explain that to you. What makes their comments shocking to me? I'll explain that. We'll look at what they said about John MacArthur and what they said about Bethel. Then we'll hear from each of these men their experiences of being slain in the spirit. Yes, both of them being slain in the spirit. Um, and then we will talk about Michael, Mike Winger's view on um, the position of uh, church prophet, which he holds to. Amazingly, we're going to learn that he uh, supports the uh, prophet at Bethel Church. Shocking. I'm shocked. Um, I thought Mike was pretty solid. 
I thought that he was just not a Calvinist. And I do not think that he's solid anymore after uh, what I watched and learned today and researched and what I'm presenting to you today. So he didn't, didn't thought I was solid. Now he doesn't anymore because of what he saw today. What he saw is actually just clips from this doctrinal watchdog channel. He didn't watch my videos. He didn't see my teaching on Bethel. He'll admit it in a moment. Um, he saw clips taken out of context from doctrinal watchdog. And so there's three lies already in there. Mike Winger was slain in the spirit. No, I was not. Mike Winger holds to the idea that churches have an official person in the position of prophet. No, I don't teach that. I don't want you to believe that. I don't believe that. Bethel holds to that. And it's one of the problems with Bethel. Um, number three, I support Bethel's prophet. Did you watch my video on Bethel, Tim? <laughs> no. In fact, he didn't. That's the next clip. He literally admits that he never even watched it, which is, yeah, here it is. And uh, here he is. This was uh, in 2018. He made a video, um, Bill Johnson Theology and Movement Examined Biblically. And it has a, over a million views. And when I saw that, I thought, good for him. Good for him. He did a good, thorough job. I didn't watch it, though. <laughs> and I've watched portions of it today, and I'm very, very disappointed. Again, the portions that he watched are, of course, just the portions that Doctrinal Watchdog cut out of context. And then Doctrinal Watchdog, this YouTube channel, added like text on the screen and the title of the video to make it sound like I was saying something I wasn't. I did correct them. I actually went to Doctrinal Watchdog's channel and wrote, hey, here's what you're saying about me. Here's not true. Here's my actual beliefs. And they all they did was change like the title of their video, slightly still misleading. Um, but they didn't receive the correction I had for them. I corrected Tim after he made this video and I gave several things that I said, these are lies about me, Tim. You need to retract this video. And he just doubled down on it. Um, and so that's why I'm bringing it to you guys. I tried reaching out to Tim personally. I actually have Tim on Messenger. He wouldn't even respond to me. He ignored me and wouldn't respond to me on Messenger, which is weird. Um, so that's where that's at right now. Um, he didn't watch it, just portions. Now let's look at two more lies. So the first three lies were that I was slain in the spirit, that I hold to the idea that churches should have official prophets in, in position at their churches. That And then the three, that I support Bethel's prophet, Chris, and I don't. Uh, number four, the fourth lie you're going to hear in the fifth lie in this next clip. Get my ear ready. I'm a little less organized today, but that's because I just don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, here we go. So... Here it is. Uh, this is on a different YouTube channel. Doctrinal Watchdog found this and posted it on their website. It's six minutes long. We'll, we'll play it, and I'll, I will stop it to give comment on it. Mike Winger and Ruslan speak of their charismatic Pentecostal experiences and defend Bill Johnson. You would never call them heretics or wolf in sheep's clothing, right? And I think that, that that's a – we don't see that enough in terms of engaging with folks that are a bit more charismatic, that it's always – their heretics, their false teachers, their wolves in sheep's clothing, that the tongues are pagan. Like I remember reading John MacArthur's study Bible commentary and he reading through first Corinthians and he's like, yeah, this was a pagan thing. It's demonic. And I'm just like, like, how is this so wild? But in your video regarding. Yeah. See Mike's response to that. Agreeing fully with Ruslan. John MacArthur's very off base on his take of Bethel church and Ruslan was re giving a review of how much he appreciated uh, Mike's review. The one that I showed you has over a million views. Bethel, you were extremely gracious and not questioning their salvation and not questioning and not calling them heretics and false teachers, which is always thrown around loosely about everybody. This person's a heretic. It's always about a secondary issue. This person's a heretic. This person's a false teacher. This person's a wolf in sheep's clothing. I get, I get called that all the time. <laughs> that's 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 hilarious that you would get called that. So, all right, in this clip, what we're getting is um, there's a difference between what me and Ruslan are talking about and what Tim is talking about. So, Ruslan is saying he says uh, that MacArthur and and many others they treat anybody who speaks in tongues today as though they're like. This is what Ruslan says. Okay, it's not even a claim I made. They, they treat uh, charismatics and anybody who maybe speaks in tongues or something as though they're actually demon possessed. And so they just start calling them like, maybe you're false brothers. Maybe you're, if you spoke in tongues, maybe you're just not even really a Christian at all. And um, I don't know for sure if MacArthur does that in his study Bible. I don't know that. When I nodded my head in agreement with Ruslan, 
as an active listener. You ever do active listening? You're listening to someone, they, they talk and you go, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Does that mean I agree fully with every single thing you've ever said in this in this time? And no, obviously it doesn't mean that. It, he just, it's just weird. Um, but Tim's response to the MacArthur stuff is interesting because Ruslan, just for clarity, Ruslan's talking about MacArthur's First Corinthians commentary. And that in the commentary, he embeds in it this cessationism. And according to Ruslan, I don't know if this is true, um, this idea that Christians today who practice these things have like some sort of demonic or pagan type thing going on if they speak in tongues, for instance. Now, that that does sound possible because it, at least at the Strange Fire conference, John MacArthur did, there were some things they said in that conference that were like, well, that was really like, you kind of made it sound like half a half a billion Christians around the world are like not really Christians based upon your standards. And I, and that's what Ruslan's happy about. He's happy that I don't do that, that I don't just casually say <clears throat> that, Hey, um, nobody's, um, nobody's saved if they do X, like say I Calvinists, I disagree with, I don't, I, you're my brothers and sisters in Christ. I disagree with you, but you're my brothers and sisters. I get it. And this is really what I'm in trouble for with doctrinal watchdog and with Tim is that Primarily, the biggest thing that they, that they say about me that's true, that's not a lie, is that I really do think that a lot of Christians are real Christians, even though they have major issues in their lives, whether it's some doctrinal things that are wrong or whether it's even some practical, like living their life and there's issues. And maybe I'm less confident that they're Christian because of the things I see, but I'm not going to call them false brethren because of it. I've done this with several people who are even prominent teachers like Joel Osteen, who I, yeah, I've got reason to wonder whether that guy's really saved or not, but I, I lean and I lean hopefully on the side that, you know, he does pro seem to proclaim the true gospel of Christ. And if you say he doesn't show me specifically where he says how you get saved is X, Y, Z, and it's not the actual biblical gospel. Like I haven't seen that, so I can't say that. Um, and, and many are so quick to just call others false brethren, fake Christians, because on a secondary issue, they differ than us. That, this is what I'm in trouble for, okay? Fine, then make a video about how bad that is and how much you don't like my teaching there and how you think it's not, not right and show it in scripture. Don't add a bunch of other lies in there, which is unfortunately what's happening with this. So um, here's uh, the, another clip on this. Notice what he says. We, we just said we disagree with John MacArthur's commentary. But if you'll look at what actually is claimed about me, what people are being told about me through Tim Hurd, Bible Thumping Wingnut, and um, uh, a doctrinal watchdog, they're and they're I consider them my brothers too. That's the thing I consider them my brothers. I just think that they're just making some big mistakes here. Um, what's, what people are being told by them though is that I trashed John MacArthur and that I and this is the crazy part that I defend a false gospel. Not those are their words, not mine. Listen to the clip. This is crazy. But Mike Winger and Ruslan trashed John MacArthur while defending Bethel's false gospel. That sounds like, that sounds like, no, that's crazy. Mike Winger defend Bethel, Bethel's gospel and trash John MacArthur? That can't be right. <sighs> but he's going to go on to say he does think it's right. Like that is what he thinks I have done is I've trashed John MacArthur. All I did was nod. <laughs> Like Ruslan made all these statements about a First Corinthians commentary, and I went, "Yeah," and then I tr that was me trashing John MacArthur. I disagree with John MacArthur. I'm going to play a clip in a minute of some stuff I was asked about John MacArthur during a Q and A one time, and um, I actually offered my thoughts on John MacArthur. I'll share that not just in a minute, but a little bit here after we get further down the road. So you can hear me, and you know I haven't changed my thoughts because I'm trying to get away from the exposure I've had from these 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 discernment guys. Rather, this is just my actual thoughts. Um, yeah. A side note, Ruslan wasn't talking about John MacArthur's view of Bethel. He was talking about his First Corinthians commentary. Tim acted like it was a discussion of Bethel when it, when it was not in that moment. Um, let's go to the next clip, though, and we'll talk here about Bethel's gospel. Bethel's gospel. And there is a cut here where they cut out some of what I said because that's the nature of taking things out of context. In terms of secondary issues, the charismatic side. You believe in the gifts of the Spirit, right? I, I believe in the gifts. Of, I call myself charismatic. Um, they name the name of Christ. They've got the essentials of the faith. For the most part, they do. Even yes. Bethel. I didn't see a false gospel in Bethel's teaching. I refuse to create a theology that allows for sickness. Okay, so the person who put this video together, um, they now have um, 
clipped in Chris Roseboro exposing the false gospel of Bethel Church. So here's this realm of the miraculous that is waiting for the stewardship of the knowledge of God put into decrees that are proclaimed over each other. <clears throat> so let's let me back this up a little bit here because it's he's preaching a false gospel by saying these words and interpreted by many as disease allowed or brought on by God. That's a different gospel. No, it's not. Paul told Timothy to take wine for his frequent ailments. Jesus didn't model it. Jesus did not heal everybody who came to him. Mark 1 is very clear on that. He didn't teach it. And Paul said, you can't change the standard. The standard is not that Christians always get healed. That's not biblical nor is it in line with even reality. Um, they name the name of Christ. They've got the essentials of the faith. For the most part, they do. Even yes. Bethel. I didn't see a false gospel in Bethel's teaching. Not yes. that I'm aware of. I listened to, to prepare for that message. I listened to 60 hours of Bill Johnson's teachings. 60 hours of Bill Johnson's teachings. Okay, I did not hear a false gospel. Okay. I spent less than five minutes to find it. So, I'm realizing there's one clip I didn't have ready for you guys. So let me just create that. It's going to take like 30 seconds. Um, what I want to do is I want to play for you my actual commentary on Bill Johnson making those claims about the gospel itself. And I want to restore my actual meaning. So there was a cut there. They removed a, a bit of what I had said uh, and what Ruslan had said about charismatic stuff and all this. Me and Ruslan both have major issues with Bethel and with their teaching and with their practices. Both of us do, which, which you wouldn't know that from the way they've cut these clips together. Um, my point about not seeing a false gospel in Bethel's teaching was that, that on that most essential thing of how you get saved, they don't affirm like something that compromises the very nature of how someone gets saved. They don't. But there is a clip where Bill, and, and the thing is, I mean, you, you see Chris Roseboro actually talking about the clip here, but I'm pretty sure that on the internet, I'm the one who found that clip first and shared it. And it was then everybody else who started sharing it because I dug through 60 plus hours of Bill Johnson's teachings, found it, found that as the most disturbing clip he has when it relates to the gospel itself. Everything else, when he talks about the gospel, which almost never does, it's very, very rare, but it's always orthodox theology. It's always right Christian theology when he discusses the gospel. But on this clip, it was not. And so let me pull it up for you guys. It'll just take a moment. Um, let me see. This is my actual discussion of why I would affirm they do teach the real gospel, but I have some reservations. I just want you to understand my actual teaching. If you want to disagree with it, fine. But the lie is that I affirm Bethel's false gospel, as in I'm here going, hey, Bethel has this really messed up gospel, and I also affirm that, and I'm totally behind it. That's the impression you get from Tim Hurd and from Doctrinal Watchdog. What's weird about the clip I'm about to share with you is it's the part they cut out from my actual teachings about Bethel's gospel. This is my actual teaching in full on why I affirm Bethel has like, I think the gospel intact, I think, meaning I'm not 100% sure, but I, I believe the gospel's intact there. Yet there are there's a, this one major teaching he has that's like dangerous and bad and it's a problem. Anyway, here's here's my more nuanced teaching. And this is, I think, what Tim Hurd and Doctrinal Watchdog hate is the nuance. They don't want the nuance. So what they do is they remove that part and make it as one-sided and ugly as possible. Um, here it is. This is probably the right clip. What is the gospel? What exactly is the gospel they're getting into? Um, I do think the gospel of, of Bethel is probably intact with additions. Um, now, it's it's tough when you add something to the gospel because if what you're adding may may pervert the gospel to the point where it's, it's a false gospel. Um, or, it, or it may not. I mean, this is a complicated issue. It depends on what you add, doesn't it? Or how you add it. Are you adding works to the gospel? That's a false gospel. So I think, but I think the Bethel gospel is intact except for one big thing that they do, which is they include in the gospel itself, the gospel of salvation, uh, now the, the heart of the gospel, right? Jesus' death and resurrection and our faith in him for salvation. That's the heart of the gospel, you know, for eternal life in Christ moving forward in the, into the future. But to them, the gospel includes something 
about healing today right now. Not just the idea of healing. It includes you will be healed today right now in the name of Jesus. God wants to heal everybody. And that to them is central to the gospel. So here is a kind of disturbing moment where Bill quotes Galatians 2. And he uses the anathema of Galatians 2, if you're familiar with the passage. He uses it against anyone who doesn't think healing, not just healings for today, but complete and total healing every time is for today. They're, they're anathematized, which is to say they have a false gospel. Let's listen to this. I refuse to create a theology that allows for sickness. Now here we got a problem. Only one. It's a small one. The Apostle Paul gives a warning in Galatians, and he says this. He says, if I, and he's the one who brought the gospel to them, he said, if I or even an angel comes to you and preaches to you a different gospel, you're to reject it. That's amazing. An angel shows up, and he brings you a different standard, a different gospel. Reject it. He says, even if I come back to you and I change my mind, don't pay any attention to me. All right, what gospel is it? It's the gospel of Jesus. It's the gospel of the kingdom. <sighs> okay. Let me illustrate. Paul refers to his thorn in the flesh, which has been interpreted by many as disease allowed or brought on by God. That's a different gospel. Jesus didn't model it, and he didn't teach it. And Paul said, you can't change the standard. That felt good. <laughs> you guys all right? You know? Yes. Uh, what he's doing here is he's actually saying you're you're anathematized, which, which means you have, you're not just cursed in the sense of like something bad will happen. You know, you have a false gospel if you don't teach that Jesus always intends healing every time. In fact, he even hung it on the idea. Some people teach that Paul's thorn in the flesh was a physical thing, was a physical illness or disease. He, it was definitely a physical ailment. Like, I don't see how you can get away around this. It was a physical ailment. That's the text. That's what it says. It was some sort of, I'm not perfectly healthy and, and, and prospering right now. Like, there's no way around it. It had to have been, even if it wasn't a disease, right? If it was like a, a limp or, or a, just, I don't know, some giant splinter sticking out of his side. Like, it still was not perfect and whole and healthy. But if I teach that now, I'm anathematized according to Bill. I've brought up a false gospel according to Bill Johnson. Um, okay, so how, how extreme is this? Does this mean that Bill's not saved? Like, I'm not sure. This is such a weird, weird theology and such a strange thing to do that I don't really fully want to go there. I want to offer the, the I don't know, the, the, the kindness, at least, you know, human kindness of saying, no, I, maybe he's just wrong, but he's still saved there. And, uh, and I sure hope so. And I think he probably is, but God knows. Okay. So the difference, um, between what I actually said and what Tim heard and doctrinal watchdog claim, I say, which is, is a lie about me and a lie to you about the things that, that I believe and that I teach and that I promote, which would lead some of you to discount me and others to actually follow Bethel because you respect me more than you respect Bible thumping wingnut or whoever else. Right. And, um, and I mean, that's as dangerous anyways. You don't want to just go with whatever teachers you respect and just run with their thoughts like it, you need to see it in scripture. At any rate, the lie that they were telling about me was I defend Bethel's false gospel. Actually, what I said, and it's nuanced, right? And people who take things out of context love it because they find these nuanced clips because they just pull out the nuanced part and make it one-sided. Um, what I actually said was, hey, Bethel has this thing. It's connected to the gospel. It's horribly false. It makes me pause in affirming that they have the real gospel, but since they have the essentials that I would consider essential, right? 
the death and resurrection of Christ, the need for faith in Christ for salvation apart from works. Um, they have those types of essentials. They do care about holiness and the life, things like that. Then I'm thinking that maybe this is an addition that has not invalidated the gospel because it's such a secondary issue. They're making a big deal about it. They shouldn't, but that, you know, perhaps they are still saved. And I'm going to be hopeful that that is the case. Sorry, I'm losing my uh, ear, earbud here. Um, that's my actual belief. Do I defend Bethel's false gospel? In no regards. Like if you were to say that gospel makes their entire gospel false, their statement from Bill about the gospel, that makes their whole gospel false, then I reject the whole thing. I just don't come to that conclusion, but I would reject the whole thing if that's the case. Um, in, if, if instead you were to say, oh, you're able to separate this wacky belief from the essentials that they affirm, then I'm affirming the essentials and I'm saying they have those. I'm not, and at no point am I defending Bethel's quote, false gospel. The weird thing is that, Tim, this is in the clip that you played of me. It just cut off before I said the rest, you know, <laughs> when it said like, oh, they affirm the gospel. You just play the rest of the clip. You have me explaining what I mean there. And that's all it would have taken. Um, so let's do the next clip. Um, but Tim didn't watch my teaching. It was Doctrinal Watchdog who pulled this clip out. Tim never watched my teaching. He watched the clip from Doct Doctrinal Watchdog. I think Doctrinal Watchdog is more at fault here for pulling it out of context in the first place. Now we get to the idea of uh, tongues and being slain in the spirit, and we'll look at that stuff. Um, I am slightly, uh, I'm slightly disposed to think that like shaking and losing control and, and pulse, like weird spazzy type behavior, that that doesn't seem like the kind of thing that would be consistent with the work of the spirit. Um, the whole slain. But Mike Winger and Ruslan trashed John MacArthur right. in the spirit thing, like passing out, that kind of thing. What he just explained thing I, I admittedly go that seems a little strange to me but it doesn't mean that it therefore is something okay. god can't do uh, okay I, I so i i as a, when we used to have theological discussions go. on this youtube channel with um progressive no. christians a uh, pretend christians it keeps who, playing it from the from the middle know, of the clip i'm sorry this was just a good example and they use scripture to defend their His restart with transition their but it's crazy not christian beliefs um, they would just quote the verse. I, it's shocking. Uh, with 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 Christ, all things are possible. Go. I, I don't have a good enough reason to just discount everything you've said. So I'm going to trust that. I've, I've and I've spoken in tongues, not with interpretation, but in a way that was very powerful in my life and mm -hmm. very needful in the moment, mm -hmm. with real spiritual blessing and benefit that happened right then at the time. All right, I've, I have to replay the clip because it played halfway through. Um, I. I'm slightly, uh, I'm slightly disposed to think that like shaking and losing control and, and pulse, like weird spazzy type behavior, that that doesn't seem like the kind of thing. Oh. I see what happened. <laughs> I was in such a hurry today. Um, what actually happened, I'll have to summarize it for you, is that uh, Ruslan up there, he, he, he get, told a story about how he went to a church and he um, had somebody come up to him and they were like, have you ever spoken in tongues? And he says, no, I haven't spoken in tongues. And Ruslan was then like prayed over by that person. And they said, you know, like he just started speaking in tongues. He said, it just started happening. Um, then he said that somebody came behind him and put a pillow behind him. And he thought, I'm not going to, this is ridiculous. This isn't going to happen. I'm not going to fall over. And his body went rigid and he fell over. And he, at that, from that moment, he said it had a new spiritual experience in his life of like holiness and seeking the Lord. It was like really good blessings in his life as a result. I responded by saying um, that I didn't have a theological reason why I couldn't believe his story. This is taken by <clears throat> Tim because I don't have the whole clip. I guess I didn't. I messed it up. Um, oh, well. This is taken by Tim Hurd and Doctrinal Watchdog to be me affirming that being slain in the spirit's a good thing. And that I think being slain in the spirit is totally okay. Now, as you listen to me explain right after I affirm that with him, I don't have a theological reason I can't believe your story, means that it doesn't break my theology to believe that one person had a genuine experience that looks like something like being slain in the spirit or certainly involves tongues, which obviously many people in scripture have that experience. But it doesn't mean that I am okay with the practice in general, which is why I made sure to add in the interview my discussion about why I think this is inconsistent with several things. I have clips down below where I talk about my my whole slain in the spirits teaching. I have video clips down below in the description where you can click on that and see that for years I've been saying, and I still affirm this, that I don't think that this is consistent with the work of the Holy Spirit as I see it in scripture. So the way I 
parse this out where I have stories where someone like Ruslan gives a story and then I have my own understanding of scripture like the fruit of the spirit is self-control and the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. These verses that seem to refute the idea that you're going to lose all control and fall over and stuff or, or speak in tongues and you can't stop. Um, how do I take the stories of individuals and then the scriptures? Well, with the scriptures, I'm going to say, I will say that I think any church that makes a rule or a practice, a general practice of doing things is an, has an extra biblical practice that seems inconsistent with scripture. That is, I do not support being slain in the spirit. But an individual who might be in that environment, could God meet them there in the midst of what's a strange practice, but is still sincere people seeking the Lord? Yes, I think that's true. And that's why I can affirm uh, that I'm not going to push back against Ruslan's story. But if Ruslan came to the church, your church, my church, some other church, and starts trying to tell everybody they have to practice the same stuff, which he wouldn't do, I'd be like, hey, stop it. Just because you had some unique experience, maybe God was just being gracious to you and meeting you there. Don't try and push that on everybody and that's if the experience was real do i think slain in the spirit's real i i no, i don't generally speaking think it's real i think it's fake which is why i share my story you will hear um in a, in a few minutes actually where i was slain in the spirit when, oh my goodness the 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 weirdness of it all so um what you're seeing me handle with this ruslan interview is a delicate situation uh theologically i lean toward it not being something god generally does but I, you know, he could meet Ruslan there in individual experience, and I won't think that breaks my theology the way it does for a cessationist. And so they tend to say like that Ruslan was like, it was something deceptive, something manipulative, something always evil, rather than maybe just God meeting him there. They they couldn't hold that view, so it breaks their theology. It's not mine. I'm not I'm not a cessationist. So the comparison of me to progressive Christians who say all things are possible is ridiculous. You guys, I have tons of content on progressive Christians. Um, you, anyway, you just, just check it out. If you, someone wants to disagree with me on cessationism versus like believing in the ongoing possibility of the gifts of the spirit, even that I'm like, I'm on the charismatic scale. I'm on the, the narrow end, right? Not like over here, people who think like every church should have people speaking in tongues and prophesying all the time. Like I'm not in that view, in that camp. But if you want to disagree with me there, make a video about that. Don't make a video pretending that I support slain in the spirit stuff when I don't. So my slain in the spirit teaching is um, available in the links below. Let's go to the next one. This is the supposed summary. So after playing these clips, Doctrinal Watchdog's video puts text on the screen and offers a summary of my beliefs. Um, and and they're, you know, they're exposing me. The problem with the summary is that it's mostly false. So let's play that clip now. Yeah, I don't know how that happens either, Mike. Because I think there's supposed to be interpretations. So to recap, Mike Winger is a charismatic who speaks in tongues, says he believes people's testimonies about being slain in the spirit. He and Ruslan are happy to trash John MacArthur in the same video while defending Bethel Church. That surprised me. I've got more, but I hope that you will comment below on uh, what we've covered so far here's yeah it actually said defending arc heretic bethel uh, uh, bill bill johnson of bethel <laughs> he skipped those words um all right am i happy to trash john MacArthur? literally i went yeah <laughs> Let's let's look at what I've actually said about John MacArthur, and I do disagree with him on on First Corinthians and speaking in tongues and several other things. But that doesn't mean I'm trashing him. That's obnoxious, and I don't think John MacArthur would think that. Anyway, here's me actually being asked about John MacArthur. This is years ago, as pretty much all the clips I'm sharing with you are old, um, showing that these are not things I'm making up. I'm just trying to share with you my actual teachings. So I'll take another question. Um, uh, MVMV says, um, can you tell me what you think about John MacArthur? Um, I greatly love and respect John MacArthur and I love the ministry he's done and he's been a stalwart um, uh, champion for the gospel of Jesus Christ and I think he's a good teacher, great teacher. I love John MacArthur, I, but he's Calvinist Mike. Yeah, I know. Still love him. <laughs> and uh, I love a lot of Calvinist teachers and 
that's that's my opinion of him. Now, a lot of times I get requests from people asking me my opinion about groups and movements I haven't really listened to and haven't heard much of. And I, I say I don't usually answer that because if I haven't heard of them, it would just be irresponsible for me to give commentary upon them, you know. Um, do I take issue with John MacArthur's um, Strange Fire Conference? Well, I've only, I mean, I've only seen clips of it. I haven't read his book and I haven't seen it. So some clips I've seen were pretty, like, that was off base, but maybe that was not most of the conference. Maybe most of the conference is stuff I would agree with. So I, I don't really want to comment on that. Yeah, because I disagree with him on the spiritual gift stuff. That's why the Strange Fire Conference stuff came up. But anyway, this is my actual view. If you want to call that happy to trash John MacArthur, you're living in your own private Idaho. Um, okay, so here's the... Here's the one that just to have me like praying, Lord, help me not respond in the flesh to all this stuff. And it was this idea that I've been slain in the spirit, that I personally have been slain in the spirit. And I, of course, I approve of these things. Um, this is this is the actual stuff I said. See if you could figure out the the thing I meant. Here's Mike in the same video talking about when he was quote unquote quote unquote slain in the spirit yeah well let me tell you a story okay true story i love stories when i was a when i was a kid i don't tell too many stories for me being a kid <laughs> to protect some of the people involved but um but when i was a kid i had a friend who their family took me to a a, a very charismatic church uh, a vineyard and i i loved it i loved it i was i was like maybe 13 or 14 at the time and just barely a new Christian, didn't know anything, didn't read, didn't read the Bible, didn't go to church on Sundays, except when my buddy and his family took me to their church. And they were charismatic at the time, at the time, this particular church was charismatic with no seatbelt. So <laughs> they were trying to get the entire youth group, which is where I was attending, right? Get the whole youth group to uh, speak in tongues at the same time. Oh, they were gosh. trying to get you to twitch and shake. Oh gosh. They were trying to get you to pass out and fall over. <sighs> yeah. And here's the truth. What, like what they just happened to him, try to get you to uh, pass out and fall over. That's exactly what he just said. I wanted point. God. I was sincere and totally ignorant of just about everything, right? Mm -hmm. But I went to God and I remember just thinking like, God, I want that. I want to speak in tongues. I want to fall over. Now, somebody would look at that crowd and they would think, Mike's a false believer because he's part of this crowd with these weird practices going on when i went up and got prayed for so that they, they that i might pass out they would have thought that's demonic that's actually demonic and they wouldn't know that inside of me was a genuine heart that really wanted to know god mm. totally ignorant totally not paying attention to the bible never reading it uh at the time i was just like barely christian you might say <laughs> and um or typical teen <laughs> one or the other and and i remember going up and no, I no, I did not speak in tongues at that time. I got up and I, I stood there being prayed over and I stood there for so long waiting to like pass out. What he's explained so far is why he should warn people about Bethel Church. There's no seatbelt on their charismatic stuff. Right. They, they have tarot cards. They do grave sucking or have done grave sucking. They all manner of wackiness. They do. There's no seatbelt at Bethel, which is why you should have spoken up boldly against Bethel so that what happened to you at this crazy charismatic church doesn't happen to somebody else. And it was, it took tons of courage just to get up there in the first place. Right. And then the guy next to me who was like, you know, there's a guy guarding you. He's there to catch you. Right. Maybe they'll touch your shoulder so that you'll know that they're there. And he just started sighing. He's like, <sighs> you know, <laughs> it didn't he's work. like, this is taking this is taking way too long. And I started, suddenly I became very self-aware and embarrassed. And so I just checked to see if he was there. And then I just like, Oh, you faked it. it. You faked it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why that, I don't know why that's funny. That's tragic. Yeah, it's, it is tragic and funny. <laughs> it's both. Things can be both. I don't know, man. You can't laugh. That's your problem. So the weird thing is that he's watching me say this 
to a charismatic who has a largely charismatic audience after the same charismatic Ruslan had just told me about his charismatic experience with being slain in the spirit. And I explained in a story of how I experienced that. And it was fake. And it was not real. It was not the Holy Spirit. It was peer pressure and ignorance and lack of scripture and uncareful teaching that was not grounded in the word of God. What does Tim think I'm trying to accomplish as I'm talking to charismatics about something that happens in the circles where there's too much, not all charismatics are like this, but where there's too much focus on these spiritual experiences, slain in the spirit, shaking, be, you know, falling over and um, losing control of your body, and that it leads ignorant and sincere people into fake and false experiences that are supposedly spiritual. That was my whole point. Like, that was my whole point. But he, in the beginning of his video, remember, I played that clip. That was the first clip I played. He says, Mike Winger and Ruslan, both of them say they were slain in the spirit. I said the exact opposite of that. This is completely a lie about me. And most people will watch the beginning of this video and never even watch the rest. They'll just think, oh yeah, the clips are probably there. And then of course the rumors will spread. Um, but this will cause some to, if they respect me, to think that being slain in the spirit is is something they could totally, oh yeah, totally, it's totally cool, no problem. Let's let's build our church around that. And others who, if they uh, don't have that much respect for me, to just dismiss my teaching and I lose an opportunity to minister to them. And I lose, I lose the benefit it has in their lives. Which, who wins in this, Tim Heard? Who wins? Okay, nobody wins in this scenario. Uh, no, no, no Christian is being warned against any false teaching because there isn't false teaching to warn against. No Christian is being helped by this. This is just an assassination thing. And, and I, I, it's, it's unfortunate. Now, this is where I want to remind you. I, I opened this video by saying that your flesh and my flesh are tempted here too. Like like Tim and Doctrinal Watchdog are already in sin and the stuff they're doing. That's just the reality of it. They're lying, they're deceiving, and they, and they won't receive correction and they won't respond to being shown that they're wrong so far. Maybe they will. Maybe after this video they do. My temptation and yours is to, is, is to further cause more division over these issues. It needs to be dealt with. It needs to be addressed. But my temptation is to hold a grudge against them after I've done this video and I've cleared up the air and I'm just going to let it go. Okay, but but yours is going to be either to feel like you're in my camp or you're in their camp. And I want to say, don't be in a camp. Just get clarity and truth. And that's it. Get clarity and truth and then have a hopeful, loving attitude towards both sides, whether you agree or disagree or whatever, because the disunity and the division is one of the dangers and temptations of all this. In fact, some of them are some of you are in the chat right now going like unity. We need unity. You're just causing more division by not paying attention to what's actually happening <laughs> and just screaming for unity. You know, um, in, instead of realizing disagreement doesn't require disunity, it's okay to have discussions and explain where there's a deception going on, but still have a loving attitude towards my brothers in Christ, Doctrinal Watchdog and, and Tim. I think Tim's wrong. I mean, I know he's wrong. <laughs> he talks about my beliefs and he says things that aren't true. Um, but it doesn't mean I, I despise him, hate him, hold. I was last night, I was just walking and praying outside, you know. Uh, I go on walks each night, help, helps me helps me fall asleep. And I was praying for Tim. I was praying for Doctrinal Watchdog. Like I would bless them. And, and this is not because I have such incredible love in my heart. It's entirely because Jesus told me to do so. And I'm trying to stir up love where there isn't enough. And this is why I just want to say, encourage you guys. Uh, I'm going to expose the deception that's here. And I have no guilt about that. or But I have an awareness that it can lead me to sin and it can lead you to sin where you're like going to go all and bomb Tim's channel and talk about what a horrible person he is. Just leave him alone. This is, this is plenty. This video is plenty. It'll do all the job, all the work. You don't need to do anything. Um, pray for him. If you get upset with him, pray for him, that God would help and encourage and bless and that he would give them wisdom, but him and whoever doctrinal watchdog is, it's just some anonymous, anonymous internet guy. I have no idea who he is. He has no easy to find information to, to get a hold of him. I was trying to contact him and it was not going to happen. So, so yes, uh, let's, let's not say that Mike Winger was slain in the spirit. Um, I was making a point of how that is abusive to people who are sincerely seeking the Lord. This idea that they have to be slain in the spirit or lose physical control of their bodies. It is abusive to people who are sincerely seeking the Lord. That's my whole point. I think Tim would agree with me on that. He just didn't notice that's what I was saying. All right, let's look at my supposed beliefs about prophets. 
which he also gets wrong. I uh, wanted to also show you um, this video here. Mike believes, as I was reviewing, preparing for this, I didn't watch the whole hour and 20 minutes of, of this not. video. Um, or is that an hour and two hours? Uh, but here's what Mike believes about the position of profit. So let's talk now. My last major subject is prophecy. Um, what happens at Bethel more than healing is prophecy. There's tons of prophecy that goes on at Bethel. And what I mean here is not just that Chris Vallotton, the prophet, speaks prophetically. I mean, everybody is speaking prophetically. Um, you hear that? Chris, what's his name, is the prophet. Mike believes that people have the position of prophet today. Now, theologically, I fully support prophecy. In fact, I have videos that talk about a biblical view on the gift of prophecy. And you, Christian, you you should be praying for prophecy. You yeah. And, okay, but what is it? What does it mean to have the gift of prophecy? You should be asking the Lord and seeking for God to give you words of wisdom or knowledge to speak into someone else's life. This words of wisdom or knowledge to speak into somebody's life. Why isn't the scriptures enough? Why aren't the scriptures enough? Obviously, Mike doesn't believe in sola scriptura, does he? But wait a minute. He does believe in sola scriptura. He A, a one-hour video on sola scriptura. How can Mike Winger believe and defend sola scriptura, but yet say you need to try to, to exercise the gift of prophecy, and he affirms the prophecy the prophet of Bethel church as a legitimate dude with a legitimate gift. How is this true? Am I the only one who was blind about Mike Winger? Am, yes. am I the, am I the only one who I w will be interested in your, in your comments. The only way I, I like, I try, I try and try and try to understand how somebody could be sola scriptura and for the for the office of prophecy today and here's how maybe mike justifies it we look to the bible as the final authority what the bible teaches is true and it's the final authority and what the scriptures teach is that the gift of prophecy has continued today and god god reveals to people what he wants them to say in the name of god to encourage other people and words of knowledge those are things if mike's using that term right as he probably knows charismatics better than i do when he said words of wisdom or and and knowledge knowledge is something you don't know like you you are able to walk up to somebody and say hey i know this happened to you in your life god has revealed to me that this happened in you and this is what it means and this is what god has to say <sighs> There's so much in there that was not true. It seems as though Tim thinks that when I said Bethel um, has a prophet named Chris v Valentin, man, I, I, I was, I know I said his name wrong in my original Bethel video every time. It was not on purpose. Valentin, Valentin, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, Anyways, what Tim's thinking is that when I said that Chris is the prophet of Bethel, I'm affirming that it's a legitimate position, right? That's what he says. It's a legitimate position that I affirm it's all real. And when I said there's tons of prophecy happening at Bethel, that I'm affirming that it's real prophecy. But if he watched more than the clip Doctrinal Watchdog hijacked from my stuff out of context, he would have heard me saying that the majority of the prophecy happening at Bethel is fake. I wasn't saying true prophecy. I think the majority of it is fake, and I think that's super duper important. I actually, I'm going to play with you now, for you now, the, um, like we're going to play cards or something. I'll play with you now. Let's just play games together. Forget all this nonsense. Um, these are my real beliefs about Bethel prophecy, and it's literally coming from the same uh, video that he says he didn't watch <laughs> before he decided to rebuke me in my ministry. Didn't even watch my video on Bethel, yet he's talking about my teachings on Bethel. All he watched was Doctrinal Watchdog's clip, but this is what's wrong with discernment ministry. Not all discernment ministry, right? I do sometimes stuff you could call discernment ministry. But it's when you don't do your homework and you don't look and find out what people really believe and really teach so that you accurately, instead you just, you just, you flip a switch. Here's what I think happens. 
I think what happens sometimes is we flip a switch and a person goes from good guy to bad guy in our head. And when they go from good guy to bad guy, we view everything they say through the most negative lens possible. And then all you need is a tiny snippet. I don't need to give you the benefit of the doubt. You bad guy, right? Like you're a bad guy. I can just take the tiny little clip. It doesn't matter what the rest of the context was. And if someone comes to defend you, they're probably evil too. <laughs> and so it's, it's not about discerning accurately what is their teaching and what is what are they saying. It's more like find the bad guys and then make sure everyone knows they're bad. And that's the whole story. But the way you find them is through doc, anonymous doctrinal watchdog clips and you don't read listen to the full context. So here's my actual teaching on Bethel. I'll let you actually listen to what I teach. And this is just from my Bethel video, right? Is, is Chris a legitimate prophet? Do I think churches should have people in the position of prophet? No, I don't. I don't believe that. And then I'll answer why aren't the scriptures enough? This ridiculous statement by Tim. So I'm not attacking prophecy. I'm here pointing out a concern I have with Bethel in particular. Listen to this video where he describes how he got people to start prophesying. Remember, Bill was in Weaverville before he came to Bethel. And in Weaverville is where he first saw the movement taking place, first saw the gifts of the spirit flowing. And so this is how it happened. I want to pray for this prophetic anointing. You, you guys would laugh if you knew how, I'm just going to tell you, I can actually go a couple minutes over in this service. I don't in the other one, but this one I can. Yeah. You know, how we started the prophetic in Weaverville years ago. There was no zero prophetic, zero. There wasn't a prophetic mouse. There wasn't a prophetic flea. <laughs> it was zero when we moved there. So I'd get men, sit around a table, and I'd turn to the one on my right and say, if Jesus were to walk in the room right now, what do you think he'd say? And they'd go, oh, I think he'd say. And I'd go to the next one. We'd go all the way around the room. And after we got all the way around the room, I'd say, do you realize that you all just prophesy? No, like, oh, it's that easy. <laughs> See, when you strive is when you miss it. Yeah. It's when you relax in who you are, abiding in presence, abiding in his voice, it becomes very natural to speak words that are life-giving. Okay, um, <clears throat> what, I, what I hear there, and I think you hear it too, is that he encouraged people to just say something that they, they imagined. And then he called it prophecy. And he tells them that's how it started. That's how it started in Weaverville. We, we, we just got people around and we just said, just say something, man. Say something nice that maybe Jesus would say if he was here. That's prophecy. Is that prophecy? No. No. Is it wrong? No. But it's wrong to call it prophecy. <laughs> it's, it's not wrong to be like, I wonder what Jesus would think of what I'm doing in my life right now. And think, I think the Lord would probably think this and use your knowledge of Jesus to try to That's a great thing. Nothing's wrong with that. But when you say that's prophecy, that's where you cross the line. So there is an encouragement and you are trained to do this. Like if you go to Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, or if you get their information, you're trained to go to your church and do this with your staff. Uh, you know, just basically get them to fake prophecy. Um, can real prophecy come out of that? Yeah. Can fake prophecy come out of that? Yep, <laughs> absolutely. And it will. Jeremiah 23, 16 backs this up. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. A vision of their own heart. So that there is such a thing as prophecy that comes from my heart, not God's heart. Prophecy that comes from my heart, not even Satan. It's just what I wish was true. It's like I dip into my heart and go, oh, you know what? Jerusalem, I love Jerusalem. I love your people. You will not be attacked. You will not be destroyed. God will lift you up. God will raise you up. And, and that's what Jeremiah's prophets, the false prophets were saying. And he says, don't listen to them. That's from their heart, not me. Jeremiah 23, a uh, little bit later in the same chapter, verses 25 and 26, it says, I've heard what the prophets have said who prophesy in my lies in my name, saying, I've dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the, de of the deceit of their own heart. And the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, so I have to be careful that I don't start speaking things that aren't true because they're from my heart, thinking that that makes it true. Again, Ezekiel 13.2 says this, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, hear the word of the Lord. That there's this difference between their heart and God's word. 
See, this is, I know I'm doing good because the cat has to come over here and confirm. She's like, preach it. Preach it, Mac. You're doing, oh, look, you're doing good. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so what's happening? When I gather a group of men together and I say, hey, what do you think Jesus would say? What do you think Jesus would say? What do you think he'd say? And then I, and then I tell them, you prophesied. They spoke from their own heart and I called it prophecy. Now, when I do this for a whole culture of people, when I do it to a whole community, I create a lot of prophecies, but they're coming from your own heart. I think if Tim had taken the time to watch my video before he made his video, he would have seen that I, when I say there's a lot of prophecy going on, I don't mean legitimate prophecy. Now, the Bible uses the terminology the same way. The Bible talks about prophets and calls them prophets when they're not true and real and good prophets. It does this all the time. I think most people understand that terminology. Uh, Tim didn't. I asked Tim to watch my video. I commented. <clears throat> he said he watched it and he still had no retractions of any kind. This is, again, why I have to make this video, because he's just continuing to spread misinformation about me. He made a whole other video about, about how right he was. <laughs> and, and there's several videos now on his channel about me. He's like three in the past couple days, or a few days. And a Doctrinal Watchdog has like increasing numbers of videos maligning me and just misleading people about me coming out every couple days, it seems now. Which is fine. I mean, that's obviously, their videos about me are getting more views than they usually get on their typical videos. Go figure. So, um, yeah, do I, so here's the lies, literal lies that Tim heard told, told about me and didn't retract, even though I confronted him about it, um, which is, which is a serious grievance. And I do think he should apologize, put up a new video explaining how he, how he was wrong. If you want to disagree with me on other issues like cessationism, fine. But Chris is not the prophet or in a real sense. He's not a prophet. He's, if you want to say, was, is he a false prophet, Mike? Um, well, yeah, like that's what it is when you have a bunch of prophecies that aren't real, like but does that mean he's not a Christian? That That's where a line I don't fully cross. You might think I'm a wimp or weak because of it. You're just not listening to me. Right? Like Kenneth Copeland, not a Christian. <laughs> um, Chris, I'm not sure. Okay, And because I'm not sure and because he affirms the true gospel, the, the things that are essential, and his issues are all on issues on things that are secondary. They're important, but they're, they're secondary. I'm not going to deny his actual salvation. I think that even a genuine Christian can be radically deceived and misled. If you don't believe that, that a real Christian can be very deceived and misled on even spiritual issues, then I understand why you would say he's not a Christian. I, I don't hold that position. Um, I don't hold that view. So we disagree on that, um, and that's fine. Make a video about that even. Go ahead. But don't turn into something that's deceptions about me and my beliefs and my teachings. Do I think churches should have official prophets? That's what Tim Hurd claimed. No, I don't. I don't agree with that. I think that's wrong. And I have videos stuff on that as well. I've never affirmed that. Um, and why aren't the scriptures enough is what he said. And he then answered his own question. The, the bottom line is that scripture definitely says, like, I'll read it to you, 1 Corinthians 14, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Especially, this is why this is the only reason why I tell people you should desire to prophesy, you should pray for prophecy, because scripture tells us to do that. The cessationist looks at those verses and they say, but that's not for today anymore. That was for the Corinthians, that was for the first century, the early church. But once we got the Bible, that stopped. The problem is they don't have convincing scripture to prove that that's true, right? So I'm literally just echoing scripture. So why didn't why, you know, why did Paul say desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy? Like, I'm just echoing scripture here, Tim. Don't be so shocked. <laughs> like, is scripture enough? Yes, and it tells me to desire to prophesy. So I should probably do that. It, it's, it's just weird. Yeah. So here's some miscellaneous things. Miscellaneous things. I'm not going to play clips on. I'm just going to share with you guys. Supposedly, I endorsed a guy named Preston Sprinkle because I literally put a comment on a YouTube video. So Preston Sprinkle and Sean McDowell had a conversation about homosexuality. Preston Sprinkle, specifically, part of the video, he offered information on two Greek words that are in, a de that are in the debate on homosexuality in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. This, uh, um, you know, neither will homosexual offenders, or depending on your translation, will they inherit the kingdom of God. And so um, the pro-gay movement, pro-gay supposedly Christian movement, wants to say that those words don't mean, um, they don't mean gay people or people who are participating in same-sex sexual behaviors in general, they're only talking about like pederasty or people, men sleeping with boys. That's all it's really talking about. Preston Sprinkle brought 
uh, information and research on those two words to show that that's not true, that it really encompasses all same-sex sexual behavior of all kinds. That would be affirming the traditional Christian view. Dr. Nawashtag doesn't know this because they don't know how to read things, listen to things in context. Tim Hurd, I don't know what he thinks about this. This isn't something he commented on. I commented on that video, that discussion with Sean McDowell. I said, oh, that was some interesting conversation. I'll be checking out his work because I want to see his work on those two Greek words because they're part of the center of the debate. And I'm always interested in more information on arsenokoitai and malakoi, I think is the, I think are the two Greek words. That's close to it. <laughs> it was similar to those words. And I was interested in more of that. So I put, I literally put a comment in a video. I don't know anything about Preston Sprinkle. I don't know if he has other weird views on other issues, at least at the time I put the comment up. Um, yeah, I just interested. But then Dr. Nawashdog put up a video of me with the clip of my comment and, and titled the video like Mike Winger endorses Preston Sprinkle. So I commented on the video. I was like, Dr. Nawashdog, I don't even know who Preston Sprinkle is really. I don't endorse him. I don't know his teachings. And then so they changed the title to like Mike Winger's highly impressed by Preston Sprinkle or something like that. And then they played a clip with that of Preston Sprinkle saying that he uses false gender pronouns as a way of being hospitable to people, something I disagree with. I don't do that. And but it implies, right, the implication is that I'm supporting whatever else Preston Sprinkle says. I know he sounds like he's coming from like some sort of uh, book, Preston Sprinkle, but uh, his name, but um, but I don't do that, right? Um, then they, he was like, and you support Revoice. And I was like, what's Revoice? So I look it up and it wasn't what Dr. Nawashdog said it was. So I pointed that out to him in his comments. And he goes, now Mike's defending Dr. Uh, defending uh, the Revoice movement. And I'm like, I'm not defending them. I just said they didn't, they aren't what you said they were. Look at their statement of beliefs. This is the, the, pointlessness of interacting with doctr doctrinal watchdog i'm not going to talk to them <laughs> so um what else is there i supposedly according to doctrinal watchdog i agree with andy stanley that we should unhitch from the old testament because i said christians are not under the 10 commandments this is horribly wrong i've talked about andy stanley's unhitch thing many times in different videos i think it's terribly bad i think andy stanley is a, is a generally bad teacher for us to listen to because of his stuff he's been saying over the past several years especially on unhitching from the Old Testament. At least get my beliefs right. But um, when I say we're not under the Old Testament law, I'm literally saying the same thing John Piper says, that Christians are not under the Ten Commandments, but we still can't lie, steal, cheat, murder, adult, commit adultery, covet, have other gods before. I'm, it, it doesn't mean those morals don't apply to us. It means that we're not under the Ten Commandments and that it's not by virtue of the Ten Commandments that we have to obey those truth. Anyway, this is not an, a controversial view, really. Um, and it's held by many, many very well respected, and in this case, John Piper, Calvinist theologian. So doctrinal watchdog, it seems, doesn't understand the breadth of theology that's that's that takes place in the body of Christ outside of perhaps their own little circle. And this causes them to think there's a lot more bad guys out there than there really are. And that's one of the problems of discernment ministry is you think, if I discern you're different than my local church, you're a bad guy. Um, there's a bunch more, um, but I'm done. That's all the stuff I'm going to respond to. Here's the lessons we can have from this is check the context. When you see a teacher that you think, and if you think this of me, right, that you think is a solid teacher, you don't agree with them on everything, but you think they're a solid teacher, they definitely have the essentials down, and they seem like a reliable and careful Bible teacher. And you see a clip of them taken out of context, showing something that seems like, wow, I can't believe they taught that. I didn't know they believed that. Go find it in the context before you believe that about them. Because I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of content online. There is going to be hundreds of things you can take out of context to make it look like I'm teaching something I'm totally not. Those who actually know my teachings know the difference, hopefully. Um, but this is how paranoia and pointless divisions created. In the end, I'm done. I just wanted to clear up the, the errors and the lies that are being said about me by Tim Hurd from Bible Thumping Wingnut and Doctrinal Watchdog and his 10 different YouTube channels that he has with all this, all different versions of the same names. Um, I just wanted to clear that up. I hope they retract their videos. I hope they, they come out and, and say, hey guys, I'm sorry we misled you. But I know personally, I've received messages from many people. Mike, I'm unsubscribing. Mike, I can't follow you anymore. I don't care about the numbers on my channel, but I do care that here's somebody who was being ministered to by this ministry that I poured my entire life into. And now, because of a lie about me, they will no longer be ministered to. 
And perhaps they'll start following this doctrinal watchdog guy and following Tim Hurd, who are willing to malign and misrepresent others and create bad guys where they don't exist and make Christians, make their circle of who they can be ministered to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it's only Tim Hurd and doctrinal watchdog and John MacArthur, because Tim Hurd likes John MacArthur. Then that's it. Everybody else is, 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 is dangerous, right? Everybody else is compromised. Everybody else is, there's some clip of them that you, 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 you know, you didn't know about. Um, so yeah, that's it. I'm done. Um, I just, I'm washing my hands of all this stuff. Like I'm not even going to think about it after this. So please, you guys listen, you don't have to console me. I've been getting lied about online for years. This is nothing new. It happens every single day. Atheists make videos doing this to me all the time. Clips out of context with their own commentary to vilify me as much as possible. I don't respond because their their followers aren't even watching my content. Like I'm not losing the ability to minister to somebody, right? I'm, I, maligning is one thing, but maligning from Christians who say they're doing it in the name of Christ, in the name of good doctrine, that's a little different. That's something I think I should um, I should respond to for the sake of those who be misled by them. Um, all this to say. There's the truth. I'm not going to let it lead me into sin and my heart towards those guys. I'm not going to obsess over it. And I hope that you don't either. I hope it doesn't have that effect on you either. But I also hope that you are able to uh, discern the reality of what was, at least what I'm teaching, whether you agree with it or not. At least you know what it is I'm teaching. Disagree with me on what I really teach. That's a good idea. There's a novel thought. <laughs> All right, well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Um, Lord, we, we pray for uh, Tim Hurd and whoever is behind the doctrinal watchdog stuff. We, we pray that you would give them wisdom. You bless them. You let them know that if they do come to a place where they realize that they've been lying about me and maligning me and, and that they're very much in error there, that they would come to that place and then realize that your grace is there for them, that your kindness is there and your forgiveness, and that I will bear no ill will or bitterness towards them. Lord, we pray that they would not have that reputation carrying with them, that others would be willing and quick to, to let it go and recognize that, that they've learned and grown. And we just do pray for that. We pray that this would not be a cause of more division, but of somehow by your spirit of more unity. In Jesus' name, amen.